Even in these days of the World Cup and the European Cup and so on, for most of us, the FA Cup final at Wembley is still the cup. The first cup final of all was played at the Oval more than 90 years ago. Unfortunately, we haven't got any pictures of that historic occasion, but we can give you a fascinating look back to the final of 1911 between Newcastle United and Bradford City. After a goalless draw at the Crystal Palace, Bradford won the replay at Old Trafford 1-0. As you know, the first cup final at Wembley was in 1923, and this is what happened on that occasion. Somewhere between 200,000 and a quarter of a million people stormed the barriers and swarmed all over the pitch. The start was held up for 40 minutes. With those two brief glimpses by way of introduction, we're going to show you the highlights of the cup finals of the past 30 odd years. Now, needless to say, the quality of the film of some of the older matches isn't perfect. But I hope you feel as I do that the interest of what's happening makes it worthwhile. In 1930, the buses, taxis, cars and trains brought an orderly crowd of just over 92,000 people to watch the fight for the FA Cup between the two survivors of the original entry of 525 clubs. King George V was escorted onto the ground by Sir Charles Clegg, president of the Football Association from 1923 to 1937 meeting Arsenal first, then Huddersfield. Arsenal's captain Parker called correctly, so Huddersfield kicked off in a match largely dominated by Arsenal's match-winning forward line, Hume, David Jack, Lambert, the great little Alex James, and Boyd Baston. The first Arsenal goal came after 16 minutes, scored by Alex James after a free kick. During the match, the German Graf Zeppelin flew over the stadium, and Philip Snowden, the famous Socialist Chancellor of the Exchequer, was among the thousands for whom its appearance must have revived memories of the first air raids on England in World War I. Huddersfield severely tested the Arsenal defence in the second half, but it was all over when James opened the way for Lambert to score Arsenal's second goal. For the first time, Arsenal had won the cup. Nineteen thirty one was the year of Birmingham's first appearance in a cup final, and for West Bromwich, in addition to victory at Wembley, it was the year of promotion from the second division. West Bromwich are the team in stripes, and slow motion shows the detail of their first goal by W. G. Richardson. In the second half, Birmingham drew level with a goal by their centre forward Bradford. Kick off, Richardson passed to Carter, who sent it out to Glidden on the right wing. Glidden passed back to Carter, who just managed to flick it to Richardson as he was tackled. And Richardson did the rest. Mighty Arsenal were the favourites against Newcastle in 1932. Hume sent it for John to score in the first 15 minutes. But then came the Newcastle goal that is still being talked about to this day. Richardson was chasing a pass on the wing, and to many it looked as if the ball had gone over the line. Arsenal thought it had and eased up. But Richardson passed across the goal mouth and Allen headed the equaliser. Allen scored again before the final whistle, and the cup went north to Newcastle. The cup final of 1933 found Everton right at the peak of their form. After having climbed to the top of the second division in 1931 and the top of the first division in 1932. The first goal of their 3-0 victory against Manchester City was scored by their outside left, Steve. For most followers of football, it's the second goal, a header by that immortal centre-forward Dixie Dean that is about standing interest. But Manchester City, though down in 1933, were on their way up. Of two names destined for even greater things after the 1934 Cup Final, one was Manchester City's right half, Matt Busby. It was the year of Manchester switching a forward position to defeat the stopper centre-half plan. 
The other now famous personality on the field is the referee. His name is Stanley Ruff. First blood went to Portsmouth when outside left Rutherford easily beat Swift in the Manchester goal. Swift, at 19 years of age, had only a few months big football behind him. But tragedy hit Portsmouth when centre-half Allen was injured 17 minutes before time. Toesland on the right wing often threatened danger and soon a shot from Tilson made it one all. Three minutes before the final whistle, Tilson accepted a cross from Hurd and scored again to give the 2-1 victory to Manchester City. Wembley Stadium surrounded by fields. That shows how things have changed in the past 30 years. In 1935, it was the Prince of Wales, afterwards King Edward VIII, who met the teams in the jubilee year of King George V. For West Bromwich, 1935 saw their eighth appearance in a cup final. But they received a shock in the first three minutes when centre-forward Palethorpe put Sheffield Wednesday one up. Wednesday's fine team, including men like Niblo, Millership and their captain Starling, kept up heavy pressure on the Albion goal, but just before the interval, Carter passed out to Boys, and Boys made it one all. Still level after the interval, and Sheffield again piled on the pressure, and the Albion's open goal was only saved by a quick hook out by right half Murphy. In fact, Wednesday did take the lead again in the second half, only for Sanford to equalise again for Albion. Two all. And it stayed at two all till five minutes before time. Then in those last minutes, Sheffield's outside left Rimmer scored not one, but two more. And this was the goal that made it 4-2. And you can see what Albion's goalkeeper Pearson thought about it. Unfortunately, owing to a dispute with the Football Association, the normal newsreel coverage of the Cup Finals was not made in 1936 or in 1937. Helicopters flew over the stadium during the match, much to the annoyance of the players, no doubt, and took a bird's-eye view of what was Arsenal's fourth final in ten years. The fact that only one goal was scored in this 1936 final was largely owing to magnificent efforts on the part of Smith in the Sheffield goal. Time and again he was severely tested by the Arsenal forwards. These pictures are typical of several critical moments before Ted Drake finally put one past him into the net 15 minutes from time. Sunderland had never won the cup when they came to Wembley in 1937 although they'd first appeared in the final in 1913, and they were the league champions in 1936. In the first half, Preston seemed to be on top. And just before half-time, Mapson was beaten by a shot from Frank O'Donnell. Six minutes after the interval, Sunderland equalised through their centre-forward Gurney. Ninety minutes later, their great inside right, Rach Carter, put Sunderland in the lead, and another from Burbanks just before the whistle made it 3-1 for Sunderland. King George VI was the royal guest of honour who shook hands first with Preston and then with striped-shirted Huddersfield for the final of 1938. Captain of the Preston side was Smith, and for Huddersfield it was Young. The Queen was among the 93,000 who watched an uneventful game with no score after 90 minutes, followed by the unfamiliar spectacle of players taking a rest before starting extra time. It even looked like going on to a replay when a Huddersfield shot was turned over the bar. Still no score with a minute to go. Then came the drama. Huddersfield's captain tackled Much and brought him down for a penalty. Much himself took the kick and Preston took the cup. Nineteen thirty nine was destined to be the last cup final before the Second World War, and it's Portsmouth in white shorts against Wolf. Watching the match with Lord Halifax was Mr. Joseph Kennedy, father of the future American president. 
Wolves were hot favourites to win, but a pass out to Warrell on the right wing soon made Portsmouth look dangerous. And slow motion shows how inside left Barlow scored the first Portsmouth goal. Now for the second. Barlow takes the ball from Wolves' right half galley. A neat back heel gives it to Rochford, who sends it up to McAlinden. Now to Warrell. Now to left winger Parker, who passes to Anderson. And here, once again in slow motion, is the second Portsmouth goal in a devastating first half. Anderson's shot was almost saved by Scott in the Wolves' goal. Two-nil in the first half, but there was worse to come. Right from the kickoff, the second half, Portsmouth just walked through the Wolverhampton defence to make it three-nil. Let's look at that one in slow motion. Unhappy Scott gets Barlow's shot, but fumbles it. Then Parker comes bustling in to scramble it into the net. Portsmouth are 3-0 to the good. The best that Wolves could do by way of reply was one goal scored by Dorset. And a perfect centre from Worrell at outside right gave a header to Parker to clinch the victory by four goals to one. So at their third attempt, Portsmouth had won the cup and the winner's medal. And with the start of the Second World War, only four months in the future, they kept the cup for seven years. And here are the opening scenes of the first post-war cup final with a bumper 98,000 gate crowding in to see if Derby County could shrug off the gypsies' curse that said they would never win the cup. It's Derby in white shirt, and soon we're back in the pattern of Wembley thrills, but this goal from the brilliant Rach Carter was offside. It wasn't until nine minutes from full time that the first goal was scored. From the wing, Derby's outside right Harrison centred, Duncan took a shot, and Charlton's right half turner deflected it into his own net. Less than a minute later, the long arm of coincidence reached out to level the score. Charlton would awarded a free kick. Turner took it, and a ricochet off Peter Doherty's legs found the net. One all. And to crown everything, the ball burst. With no further score before the whistle, we're now looking at extra time when Derby County took the lead once more with a goal by Doherty. Now Derby really settled down to business. This is how Stamp scored the last goal of the match to make it a win for County by 4-1. And so at last, after seven years of war and two narrow escapes in air raids, the cup changed hands once again. Brilliant sunshine after the frozen winter of 1947 marked the eighth occasion on which a club defeated in one year's cup final came back to victory in the next. And for the second year running, the result was left until extra time. The losing side, Burnley, are in dark shirts and white shorts. Here comes a threatening move by Burnley as Ray Harrison passes to Chew. But Bartram was there to save. And here's a brilliant piece of dribbling with Charlton's right-back Croker weaving his way through the opposition. Both sides were largely concentrating on defence, but here, with no goals scored, Burnley swung over to the attack. And a terrific shot by Pop hits the bar. Again, we're in extra time. Harrison has the ball and it looks like a trip, but play goes on and this is virtually Burnley's last effort. A few minutes before the end of extra time, Charlton found a chance and grabbed it. 
scoring the only goal with a scorching shot from outside left stop. In 1948, we saw the teams for the first time coming out from the pageant tunnel. For Blackpool wearing the white shirt, it was their first cup final. Blackpool's side was remarkable for two remarkable standards. Stan Mortison had scored in every cup tie of the season, and here he looked set for an opener when he was brought down by Chilton, the United centre half. Shimwell took the penalty and Blackpool were one up after 14 minutes. But on this afternoon the fans were treated to a display of attacking football of high quality and Rowley seized a moment of Blackpool indecision to score the equaliser. The other Stanley in the Blackpool side was the one and only Matthews. Again and again he brought the crowd to their feet with his superb and masterly control of the ball. Again and again he sent the forward line racing into dangerous attack. And a pass to Mortensen nearly paid off, but Morty was well tackled. A foul on Matthews led to a free kick. And from this, Stan Mortensen flashed in a second goal and Blackpool led once more. So at the restart, Blackpool led by two goals to one. But by this time, Matthews was being marked almost to a standstill. Again, Blackpool attacked, and somehow Matthews evaded his bodyguard to centre, but nothing came of it. Then it was United's turn. From a free kick for a foul on Delaney, Rowley headed the equaliser. Two all. Now, with barely 15 minutes to go, Manchester United threw everything they had into an all-out victory drive. And it was Pearson who put them ahead for the first time. Another goal by Anderson made it a 4-2 victory. And having won the cup, they nearly lost it again. So they made it a team job to carry it off. There was a change in the pattern of royal greetings in 1949. While Prince Philip was meeting Wolverhampton, the Duke of Gloucester was meeting Leicester. Leicester's captain Norman Plummer was lucky with the toss against Billy Wright, but this was to be the day of triumph for Wolverhampton, their first cup final victory since they defeated Newcastle in 1908. Radley was soon threatened in the Leicester goal. Hancock centred and centre forward Pye beat him with a header and Wolves were one up. Before half time, a corner taken by Hancock spelt more danger to Leicester. Bradley got to it but pushed it out to Mullen. For a moment, it looked as though Leicester were out of trouble. Then Billy Wright centred the ball into the goal mouth and Smythe put Wolves two up. After the interval, Leicester piled on the pressure to reduce the two goal deficit. And a clever solo effort by Leicester left winger Adam took the ball to the Wolves goal area. Then with a fine effort by Griffiths, their outside right, City reduced the lead to 2-1. And among the crowd enjoying a fine afternoon of grand football was Mr Ernie Bevin. For a time, the game seemed to be running for Leicester. Clever footwork by Jay Harrison made an opener for what might have been the equaliser, but it was offside, and a third Wolves goal made it a 3-1 victory. It was Liverpool's captain Phil Taylor who won the toss against Arsenal's Joe Mercer in this meeting of North and South. But it was Arsenal who attacked first on the unusually rainy cup final day of 1950. Here you'll recognize Arsenal's outside left in his Compton, perhaps better known for making runs with a bat in his hand. Now let's see how Arsenal scored their first goal. Wally Barnes sent the ball up to Logie. Logie tapped it over to Reg Lewis and it was 1-0 to Arsenal.
fine slow motion let's see how nearly Liverpool came to a quick equaliser when Swindon in the Arsenal goal fumbled the centre from outside right pain. In the second half, Arsenal renewed their attack. Cox centred from outside right, took the return pass and sent it in again, but out of the melee, Sidlow was safe in the Liverpool goal. While Arsenal manager Tom Whittaker and Liverpool's George Kay looked on in scrutiny. Now Liverpool's left half Jones began a menacing movement. Here was a moment of real danger for Arsenal as Swindon again fumbled and the ball came right back at him. That was Arsenal's last moment of danger. Sidlow in the Liverpool goal was to be beaten a second time by Red Lewis. The first half of the 1951 final was a period of breathless escapes. Slow motion shows Perry's corner for Blackpool finding the head of Mortensen and beating Fairbrother. But Cowell heads it back to a thankful goalkeeper. No score at half time. Second half and it's tragedy for Blackpool as a pass by Matthews leads to a fatal Newcastle breakaway. It's Newcastle in strike. A pass from Robledo goes to Jackie Melbourne. A moment of hesitation. Was he offside? But Melbourne was waved on by the referee, and there was only the lonely farm left to beat for the goal. One up to Lucas. Soon after, Newcastle made sure of it. Taylor slipped a neat back heel to Melbourne. And from 25 yards, Melbourne made it 2 0. For thousands at Wembley that afternoon, perhaps even for some from Newcastle, there was regret that the great Stanley Matthews should play two cup finals in four seasons without a winner's medal. And as the minutes ticked away, they watched fascinated as the Matthews wizardry tried and tried to save the day. But it was not to be. Even the last minute, Matthew's shot went over the bar. So Winston Churchill was the guest of honour when Newcastle, in their familiar stripes, came back to defend the cup in 1952. And how his fighting heart must have warmed to Arsenal in the match that followed. Both teams had suffered the scourge of injuries on the way to Wembley, and this afternoon the bad luck still held. Arsenal's international Wally Barnes injured a knee and went out to the wing. Halfway through the first half, another mishap took him off the field for the rest of the match. Arsenal's defence was magnificent in adversity. Swindon punched clear, and when a Melbourne header came back, Smith was there to save the goal. Danger man in the Newcastle side was brilliant Bobby Mitchell. Again Swindon got it away, and again it came back, but safely over the top. Yes, even the opposition was full of admiration for Arsenal. But magnificent too were Newcastle. Once again, Bobby Mitchell weaved his way in from the left wing. Only six minutes to go and still no score. Then one more Mitchell centre found the head of Robledo and flashed in off the post. Newcastle had won two years running, a 20th century record. Too bad that the brilliance of their achievement should be overshadowed by the gallant performance of the losers. For the first time, a reigning queen was the guest of honour at the Cup Final of 1953. And this Wembley afternoon of coronation year was to be one of the most sensational of all. Remember, it's Blackpool in the white short. The first goal came after only 90 seconds play. Holden passed to Nat Lockhouse and Bolton were one up. A few moments later, and once again, Lofthouse sent a thunderbolt at the Blackpool goal. It hit the upright. Langton drove it in on the rebound. Shimwell blocked it, and Fenton somehow managed to push it out of harm's way. Now, with the ball at the feet of Matthews, it was Blackpool's turn. A quick pass to Stan Mortensen, and Morty's shot ricocheted off Hassel into the Bolton goal. One all.
Bolton quickly climbed back into the lead when Farm came out to clear, but Moyer beat him to it. Bolton two, Blackpool one. Bolton's left half Bell had been injured and was now limping out on the left wing. But when Holden centred, somehow it was Bell who got to the header and made it 3-1 for Bolton. Bolton, with only nine fit men, was still leading 3-1 with only 20 minutes to go when Matthews put across the centre. Hanson misjudged it and Mortensen made it 3-2. Of all the 100,000 who saw this match, no more than a handful knew that Matthews had a thigh injury that had nearly kept him in the grandstand. Now it's a free kick for Blackpool, and Mortensen takes it with only three minutes to go. Three all. It must be extra time. But no, there was time enough for Stanley Matthews to give a perfect pass to Perry, and Perry scored the goal that made it unbelievably 4-3. So it was that the young Queen Elizabeth presented the cup to Johnston at Blackpool's third attempt. And there was a cup winner's medal at last for the great Stanley Matthews. For the only time in the history of the FA Cup, the winning team gave the chair of honour to two men, their captain and the man who had become a football legend. In 1954, the Queen Mother came into the arena for what had formerly been the purely masculine job of greeting the teams. In the opening stages of the game, West Bromwich gave convincing evidence of their understanding teamwork and the left wing looked especially dangerous. And here comes their first reward. Scramble in front of the Preston goal and Allen races in to score. Within a minute, Preston had equalised with a header by Morrison. And soon came another shock for Albion. They stopped to appeal for offside while Wayman was taking the ball on to beat Saunders and make it 2-1 for Preston. Albion's wing half Barlow began a counter-attack and Preston's Doherty brought him down. A penalty was awarded to West Bromwich. Centre forward Allen took it. That was two all. Then right at the end, Albion stormed into a concentrated onslaught on the Preston defence. With only seconds in hand, Griffin scored Albion's victory goal. The strikes of Newcastle appeared in the Cup Final of 1955 for the third time in five seasons, and the tenth time in all. And when Jackie Milburn forced Ewing to concede a corner, they were away to an electric start. Len White took the kick, and Milburn headed it in past Trotman to give United the lead in the first few minutes. Don Reavy was the spearhead of the Manchester attack. He quickly got the city forwards moving in a series of raids on the Newcastle goal, but the defence stood firm. Just before half-time, Manchester's persistence paid off. A pass from Hayes found Johnston, and Johnston headed the equaliser. So when Newcastle kicked off after the interval, honours were even. But unhappily, the injury bogey turned up again. This time, the victim was the Manchester right-back Meadows, whose knee injury took him off the rest of the match. Mitchell on the left wing ran the weakened City defence off their feet and himself beat Trotman to make it 2-1. The Newcastle forwards kept up the pressure to make probable victory certain, and against them, the ten men of Manchester could do no more. Once again, it was Mitchell who set the scene. Trotman partially cleared, but Hannah gave Newcastle the last goal to make it a 3-1 victory. This year, once again, last year's defeated side came back to win. It was the year of the Reby plan, 
shown here in action with the deep-lying centre-forward racing up for the return pass. It certainly worked. Don Revy now passed on to his inside right Hayes and Manchester were one up in two minutes. But neither the Revy plan nor the early goal was enough to rattle the tough Birmingham side of 1956. With a shot from inside right Kinsey, it was one all at half-time. Birmingham kicked off for the second half, but by this time Manchester were beginning to look like the winning side. Right winger Johnston beat several defenders and a pass to Hayes spelled fresh danger to Birmingham's goal. Now it's Johnston again, leading another Manchester attack. He passes to Dyson, and Dyson beats Merrick to make it Manchester City 2, Birmingham 1. And only four minutes later, it was Johnston in possession again, and Johnston scored Manchester City's number three. Out of the Birmingham efforts to save the day came a tragic accident. After a heavy collision, Trotman, the Manchester goalkeeper, was hurt and shaken. He gamely played on to the end, and it was not known till afterwards that his neck was broken. He was out of football for over a year. was only six minutes old when once again there was work for the ambulance men. The ball went to Villa's outside left, McParlin. He headed for goal and followed up. And he and Wood, the United goalkeeper, collided. A hundred thousand spectators stood silent as Wood was carried off with a damaged jaw. This year, the white-shirted United, as league champions, were chasing the double, which, oddly enough, their opponents, Aston Villa, were the last to achieve in 1897. And here comes a wonderful save by Sims from Taylor. After some time in the dressing room, Wood returned gallantly to the field, but it was Jackie Blanchflower who kept the Manchester goal for most of the match. And splendidly, he did it. There was no score at half-time. In the second half, Dixon on the wing sent it to McParland, who'd moved inside, and a lovely McParland header put Villa one goal to the good. Now with the ball on Villa's right wing, Smith passed to Crowther. Crowther centred, and the moment was approaching when Villa would be making cup history. Dixon shoots, it hits the bar, and it's McParland again, who scores number two for Aston Villa. It's odds on now for Villa's seventh cup final victory. Manchester fought on like Tigers, and a tailor headed was just tipped over the bar. Then from a corner, Taylor headed a beautiful goal, but Villa had already won. The Duke of Edinburgh greeted the finalists in 1958, but on this occasion, it was overshadowed by tragedy. Or eight men who should have lined up with Manchester had died in the Munich air disaster. Others who survived would play no more football. Watching was manager Matt Busby, also a survivor, and the Munich doctor who served the injured with such devotion. Needless to say, it was the white-shirted Bolton who had expected to win. Incredibly, though, United scratch side had come through after the fourth round. After two minutes, Edwards passed to Nat Lofthouse, and Lofthouse slid in the first Bolton goal. One fantastic piece of bad luck hit Manchester. A shot from Bobby Charlton crashed off the upright into the goalkeeper's arm. Before the crowd had timed its gasp at Bolton's escape, the ball had gone surging upfield into United's heart. Bolton's inside right Stevens shot. Greg held it, and Lothouse sent ball and man crashing into the goal. Let slow motion show us again that final Bolton goal. Many of us, if it was leaked, but it gave Bolton the 2-0 victory. The exchange of pennants was not the only novelty in 1959. It was Luton's very first final, and Forrest had been finalist only once before. But there were no signs of Wembley nerves about this first goal for Forrest from Dwight. Throughout the match, Luton were outclassed. 
There were many anxious moments for Baino in goal, and inside 40 minutes, Wilson put Nottingham Forest two up. Then a midfield collision brought an unpleasant reminder to the spectators of the casualty lists of recent years. Dwight was carried off with a broken leg, and Forrest had only ten men for the rest of the match. Forrest goalkeeper Chick Thompson had one or two testing moments, and here comes the movement that led to the only Luton goal. Left back Ken Hawke sent it, and left half Dave Pacey reduced the deficit by one goal. The 1960 final brought together experienced cup fighters. Blackburn Rovers and White Shorts played their first final in 1882, while Wolves' first appearance was in 1889. This year the first goal was for Wolves, when a shot by Stobart went off McGrath into the net. Then just before half-time, Rovers' left-back Whelan was carried off with a broken leg. So once again, a Wembley final second half saw the losing side reduced to ten men. Another strong Wolves attack gave centre forward Jimmy Murray a chance to beat Leyland in the Rovers goal, but it was offside. Next excitement came when Wolves captain Bill Slater was fouled, to the great disgust of at least one lady. Foul! And then Wolves South African Des Horn took the ball clean through the Blackburn defence on his own, but nothing came of it. But Horn featured in the second goal with a pass to Dealey. Dealey made it Wolves 2, Blackburn 0. With only two minutes to go, Dealey found the ball in a goalmouth scramble and rammed it home to clinch the Wolverhampton victory. And so the cup was handed by the Duchess of Gloucester to Footballer of the Year Bill Slater. It was the Duchess of Kent who shook hands first with Leicester and then with Spurs in 1961 when white-shirted Tottenham, as league champions, were hoping to bring off the historic double. But it was not until the second half that Smith beat Banks to give Spurs a one-goal lead. After this first goal, Tottenham showed more of their true form. And though Leicester were now playing only ten fit men through an injury to Chalmers, their defence stood firm. Spurs attacked again. It looked like a foul and Dyson raised an appealing arm. But the attack went on and it was Dyson who headed the second goal for Spurs. So for Danny Blanchflower and his men, 1961 was the year of that 20th century record. The league and cup double for Tottenham Hotspur. Back at Wembley for the second year running, the white-shirted Spurs of 1962 wanted goals in a hurry, and in three minutes, Reeves had put them one up. Now Spurs forced a corner, and the moment of danger is caught by slow motion as the ball goes wide. Spurs kept their lead for the first half, but five minutes after the restart, Harris sent it to Robson, and Robson stayed it in between Brown's legs. But straight from the kickoff, Spurs again took the lead. Back to Blanchflower. Up to White. White to Cliff Jones. Back again to White, and White centered, and Smith made Spurs 2-1 in the lead. Spurs were now having the better of it, and presently it looked like another Spurs goal when Jones and Blacklaw clashed and the ball bounced clear. But when it came back from Medwin, it was handled by Cummings in the goal mouth, and it was a penalty for Spurs. Danny Blanchlar took the kick. And by three goals to one, Tottenham had won the cup for the second year running. Leicester City, the team in white, began the 1963 final with a promise they failed to live up to. 
An early attack broke on the Manchester defence and soon United were giving a copybook display of cup-winning football. What's the classic detail of their first goal? A perfect pass from Crerand went to Dennis Law and then... Manchester United began the second half still leading by that single goal. Then Bobby Charlton took the ball down and shot. Heard took it and Manchester were two up. For a short time in the second half, Leicester City looked dangerous, but every attack fizzled out till from a free kick, Keyworth headed the City's only goal. A brilliant header from Dennis Law was nearly another goal for United. Banks grabbed the ball on the rebound, and there's no doubt that the films lost a wonderful actor when Dennis Law took up football. But United's brilliant football was rewarded again when Banks mishandled a Giles centre. Heard put it in and it was a 3-1 victory and the cup for Manchester United. Manchester United have kindly lent it to us for our film, so you can see it's none the worse for that rather boisterous treatment. Its full name is, of course, the Football Association Challenge Cup. But if you just talk about the cup, that's all you need to say about the top event in football.